Hilchais Tefila Perek Shishi, the laws of prayer, chapter six. The topic is basically a number of different laws. There's not one topic that unites everything in today's chapter. It's kind of like finishing the discussion on an individual's prayer. Different laws relating to an individual who prays. Can you add to the prayers? What, do you, what should you do if you were in the middle of doing something and it came time for the prayers? And then we're going to see tomorrow is the morning blessings. Then we move on to the laws of praying bitzibur, praying in a community, praying in a minion, which is what we do here every day. But now we're still in the laws of the yachid, the laws of the individual, so here we go. Halacha Aleph. Asur lo le'adam la'avor, achore beit ha'kneset, b'sha'a sh'ha'tzibur mitpalalim. It's forbidden for a person to walk behind the shul when the community is in the middle of davening. Behind, according to many commentaries, means by the door. You're walking by the door. Everybody inside is in the middle of praying, and you're just walking by. You can't do that. Unless you were carrying a load. Because if you're carrying a load, then people realize you're not just avoiding shul. You're on your way with, you know, you're carrying something, you're busy with something. Or the shul had two doors on both sides. So if you walk by this door, nobody's going to judge you. Maybe you're going to come in through that door. The person watching might say, Perhaps he's going to go and enter from the other door. So too, if there was in the city two shuls, the person who sees will say, Maybe he's on the way to the other shul, which he's used to attending. The idea of not passing by a shul when people are praying is that people shouldn't think you're avoiding the shul. So if there's any other way to explain you're not attending, they'll explain it. Another example, if you have tefillin on your head, you can go past the shul even if no other conditions are met. There's no other shul, there's no other door, there's no other load, nothing. You're wearing tefillin, you're already showing that you're a dedicated Jew. The tefillin prove about you that you are those who chase after mitzvahs, you're not those who are just looking to cancel Davin. Another law that relates to the individual based on the community. Typically when you daven with a minion, you're not supposed to lengthen your davening too long. If you're part of the community, try to keep up with the pace. But if you were davening by yourself, you have the option to pray as long as you want. If after you finish your Shemona Esra, you want to say the whole confessional prayer of Yom Kippur on a regular Tuesday, Omer, no problem, you can say it. Similarly, if you wanted to add to the text of every one of the middle blessings, something related to the topic of that blessing, Mosif, you can add. For example, what does that mean? Halacha Gimel, Ketzad. How would you add to blessings? Let's say you had a relative who was sick, or somebody, a friend who was sick, and they need a blessing for health. You ask for mercy for him in the blessing of the sick, according to your smooth tongue. In other words, you know Hebrew, you're familiar with the text. Add a little bit of Hebrew, or if you're davening in English, add something in English. The point is you can add to the blessing of Rifa'inu for other sick people. If you needed some money, some, some financial sustenance, you can add a, a plea, you can add a request in the blessing of the years, for Parnasa. The same applies to every one of the blessings. If you want, you can add to the text of the blessing. If you wanted, not to add to every blessing, but just in the middle of Shema Koleinu, just before you finish, the, it's a general prayer to listen to our voice, so you wanted to ask for all your particular needs during that blessing, Shoel, you can ask. But you don't ask for your needs in the first three or the last three blessings. Those texts stay the same, they stay untouched and unchanged. But everything else, no problem. But it sounds like from the Rambam that you can only do this if you're davening on your own. If you're davening in the tzibur, anything that you're going to add to the prayers are going to make it longer and are going to make you take longer to catch up to the minion, and therefore you shouldn't do it. Nevertheless, in today's poskim, the modern day commentaries, they say that you shouldn't add to other blessings, but you could add to Shema Koleinu even with, if you're in the minion. You want to add a private blessing in Shema Koleinu for a shiduch, for a parnasah, for whatever you need, you can do it, take a little short time, and then you go along and catch up to the minion. Halacha Dalet. Now we're going to talk about 
other things that cannot be done before, uh, before davening. It's forbidden for a person to taste anything or to do any work from after dawn rises until you daven the morning prayer. Because since technically from the moment of dawn you could pray if you needed to, if you're on a business trip or whatever it is. So therefore, the moment comes of, of a mudashachar, you have to consider yourself as if you're in the zone of davening and you can't do anything that would disturb you from davening, like eating or doing, doing work. You also cannot arise early and go to your friend's house to wish him well and see how he's doing before you daven shacharit. They even say in some, in some halachic books, you can't say good morning to another person before you daven. Instead, you should use another type of language and say it in Aramaic, tzafra de maratov, or something like that. The idea is you shouldn't be involved in checking out your friend's well-being before davening. You shouldn't go on a trip before you daven. That's only for the morning prayer. You cannot, but you could eat and you could do work before you daven Musaf or before you daven Mincha, which is why today on uh, Simchat Torah, for example, what do we do? We make Kiddush after Shacharit and then we eat before Musaf or before Mincha. But you cannot have a full meal close to Mincha. You taste a little snack, but not a full meal. Halacha hey, kevan azman mincha gedola. There are special rules that apply to Mincha. As soon as the half an hour after midday arrives, and it's time for the, the, the early Mincha, lo yikanes la merchatz, afilu lehazia ad sheit palel. You cannot go into the bathhouse, even just to take a sauna for a sweat, until you daven Mincha, shema yitalef, v'yibatel menat tefillah. Perhaps you're going to faint, feel faint, and you're going to lose the chance to daven. You also can't eat before Mincha. Afilu achilat aray, even a snack. Shema yimashech ba'achila. Perhaps you might get pulled into the eating and make it into a fuller meal. Velola dun. Just in the last halacha, we said you can't have a full meal, but you could have a snack before Mincha. So the commentaries say it's different levels of snacks. There's like a snack that's literally just a taste, and there's a snack that's more like what's called a kazayat of food, or an olive size of food, even though it's still a snack, but that's, that's what you shouldn't do. Um, before Mincha, just first daven, then, then go eat. But Lola Dun, you shouldn't go to a court case. I feel a big din, even if it's just the final part of the court case where you seal the deal. Shema Yisatera Din Sheikh, perhaps somebody will come up with evidence and it will destroy the case, and you get drawn into it, V'yibatel Menat Filah, and you're going to stop davening. V'chen lo Yeshev Lifnea Sapar Lispor, you also shouldn't sit down in front of the barber to take a haircut. I feel a Tispor Tediot, even if it's a regular man's haircut. Unprofessional. Ad Shid Palil to you daven, Shema Yishaver Hazug. Perhaps the scissors might break and it will cause you to delay davening. You also shouldn't go into a tannery to work skins, hides, ibud uh, orot, like a place where you work animal skins. Samuch mincha, close to mincha time, ad shi palel, till you daven mincha. Shema yir'eh have said dimlachto v'yitasekba, because you might observe some loss in your work and you'll get involved in it. V'yitakev menat filah and be held back from davening. But the Rambam says, if you began any of these things, you began a meal, you began a court case, you began working in the skin shop, anyway, even though it was mincha time, you don't have to stop. You finish first, and then you daven mincha. Of course, if there's no time in the day, you have to stop and daven mincha. But we're talking about over here where it's mincha gedola, it's the early mincha, so you have time in the day, you finish, and then you go back to davening. Halacha vav. The Rambam has to clarify, when do these activities begin? You say you can't sit down to a barber. What's called sitting down to a barber? When is the beginning of a haircut? Start. The moment you put the cloth of the barber over your knees. They would put a cloth so hair shouldn't get all over you. You put down that cloth, the haircut has begun. What's called the beginning of a bath? The moment you take off the, the, the piece of clothing closest to your skin, so your undershirt in today's day and age. What's considered the beginning of going into the hide place, the, the, the tannery? The moment you tie the cloth around your shoulders, apparently it was kind of an apron, like the workers used to do, that's called starting the business of tannery. When is considered the beginning of eating? For people of Israel, when you wash your hands. For people of Babylonia, the moment you undo your belt, you unfasten your belt for the meal, ah, now you've already started the meal. What's considered the beginning of a court case? The moment the, the judges put on their talit and sit down. If they were already sitting. The moment litigants begin litigation. 
When the lawyers start talking or the people start talking, that's when the case begins. Halacha zayin. That's all for mincha. Afal pishut filat arvit rishut. Now let's move to evening time. Even though the evening prayer is optional, you don't have to do it necessarily. Today we all do, but ideally, halachically, by dry legal definition, it's an optional prayer. Lo yavo adam mim lachto yomar. A person shouldn't come back from work and say, Ochal ma'at ve'ishan ma'at v'achrechet palel. I'm going to eat a little bit, then I'll sleep a little bit, then I'll daven. Shema te'en lo sato shena. It's a long day of work. Maybe you're going to get overcome by sleep. V'nim sayashen kol halayla. And you're going to sleep all night. Miss arvit. You come home from work, Davin Meyer right away. Then go eat, then go drink, then go sleep. Interestingly, it's counterintuitive. You're allowed to take a haircut, you're allowed to take a bath before Shacharit, before the morning prayer. Because the sages only decreed it about mincha time, when it's common for people to go to take a haircut. Excuse me when it's common for people to go take a haircut in the middle of the day or go take a bath in the middle of the day. Sharov ha'am nichnasin sham bayom. Most people go into the bathhouse or a barber by day. Aval bashachar, but early in the morning, davar she'i no matzui, it's not common. Who takes a haircut at 6 a.m.? Lo gazrubo. Therefore, there's no decree. So fascinatingly, sometimes you end up with a leniency where you would think to be strict. You think it's before shachar, it's the most important prayer, you're going to get involved in a haircut, you're going to miss it. No, because no one usually does it. So if you're being the unusual guy, there's no worry. You do your thing and you go daven shachar. <laughs> Somebody was learning Torah. And it comes time for davening. You must stop and daven. But if your Torah was your job. And Torah your job means you learn Torah all day, every day, at every moment. You don't do any work at all. And you were learning Torah at the time that it came to Davin, a no posek. You don't have to stop. The mitzvah of Torah study is greater than the mitzvah of Tfilah. We saw in the last set of laws for Kriyat Shema, even a person who studies Torah all day has to read Shema. But for Torah study, you don't have to stop. The classic example in Tom was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He learned Torah all day, every day. He didn't have to stop for, for Davening. If you're a communal activist, you're dealing with communal matters, you're like learning Torah, you don't have to stop for davening. The only time a person should stop his davening, interrupt, is if there's danger to the life. Even if a Jewish king is asking how you're doing, you don't answer him. But you should stop if a non-Jewish king, an idol worshiper, asks you how you're doing, Shema Yahargenu, because he might kill you. But a Jew knows that you're in the middle of davening, you won't uh, take offense. Haya omed batfila, if you're in the middle of davening, vira'a melech obed kochavim o anas, ba and you see somebody coming that you're going to have to answer to, an idol worshiping king, or a terrorist, a guy who's going to force you to, to answer him. So he's not here yet, he's coming, what do you do? Yikatser. You should shorten the davening. Commentaries say shorten means just say the beginning and end of every blessing. Finish up quickly. If you can't, then you should stop and wait for him to come. Similarly, if you saw snakes or scorpions coming towards you, if they reached you and in those places snakes and scorpions were poisonous, they can kill you, stop and run. But if the habitat was not a place where snakes and scorpions were killing, their venom wasn't poisonous, you cannot stop. You can't stop davening for anything. Even though the law here is so strict, nevertheless, if it disturbs kavana, if something's happening that's disturbing your intent, then you do have to stop and move away so you, get, you can get refocused. That's why I said the other day that you can stop if a kid is disturbing you, you can stop. These are all talking about interrupting davening for other reasons. Can you interrupt? No, you can't. Just for threat of death. We said this in the beginning of the laws and we're repeating it here as well. Women, slaves, and children are obligated to daven. Anybody who is exempt from reading the Shema, like a person that's getting married or a person that has a death, a funeral, um, is also exempt from davening. Anybody who's part of a funeral, escorting the dead body, even though the, fu- the coffin doesn't need them, they're exempt from prayer. When it came to Shema, only if you're involved in the coffin, you're exempt. When it comes to Tfilah, if you're part of the funeral, you're exempt from davening.